Okay, so now that we've reviewed and gone over asexual reproduction and some of the variety that occurs there, let's look at sexual reproduction. So with all forms of sexual reproduction, you need two parents. Um, and there are different mating systems that can be applied to different species. Now, these are the rules, and sometimes there are species that will do more than one of these or that will have a mix of two that it might not be clear if it's one or the other but for our purposes we're going to look at examples where these are very clear and kind of, uh, of easy to tell so there are five different mating systems the first mating system is promiscuity so in promiscuity there's no pair bonding between uh, males and females um, there's no relationship at all, it's just fine to mate, mate with them, and in most cases the male then will uh, leave, the female will often lay her eggs and leave also, and there's often very little parental um, care of the offspring, but no connection other than the mating connection between males and females. In a monogamous system there's a close social relationship between the male and the female, and emperor penguins are a good example of a monogamous system. In fact, if you're an emperor penguin and you have one of the other systems, it really does not work out well for you because two parents are required to successfully raise an offspring. And so in their environment, monogamy has been strongly selected for. B is polygyny. Now both polygyny, polyandry, and to some extent polygynandry, these last three, are all types of polygamy. Polygamy is a more general term, and polygamy loosely means any relationship where there is multiple um, mates, and that can be multiple male mates, multiple female mates, or both. Those are polygamous systems. Polygyny, here at the top with a G-Y-N, that's the Greek root word for female. So in a polygynous system, there's more than one female mate. So elephant seals and some other mammals are examples of polygynous mating systems. In elephant seals, the largest males will fight for a stretch of the mating beach, and then they have the opportunity to mate with all of the females that are in their territory. So one male, many females. Polyandry, andros is the Greek root word for male, is when there is one female and many males. Honeybees are actually a good example of a polyandrous mating system. For each hive, there's a single queen bee who is the reproductive individual in the hive. And then there are multiple male drones that will mate with her. And the male drones actually die shortly after they mate with her, but she has multiple mates, and so her offspring have more genetic diversity because of that. So polyandrous, one female with many male mates. And then finally, polygenandry, which as the name implies, is a combination of um, multiple males and multiple females. So there's some birds that mate together. Now this is not a promiscuous system because they do form a bond within that family unit. Multiple males, multiple females, often it's flexible as to how many of each, but they form a strong social unit together. They won't just allow anyone, other birds that are outside of that social system to mate, so it's not a truly promiscuous system, okay? So Again, some mammals will use a combination, or animals will use combinations of these. Some plants also will have different ones. Now, we don't really have the same thing going on in plants. It's more about pollination uh, when we're talking about plants, so it's not really a behavioral thing. But with animals, um, we can get them that are mixed. So, for instance, if I asked you humans, what is the mating system that the human species uses? And the short answer is there is no single mating system. It depends on the culture, right? And cultures, uh, one or another one of these might dominate. And it's very difficult in humans because of our cultures to have widespread polygyny, polyandry, or polygynandry. Just those are not as common, but they do occur in some cultures to one extent or another. So humans really have all of the above, with perhaps certain cultures emphasizing one of these strategies over another. And many species are like that, where there's no single mating system, okay? So, which is better, sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction? Now, there's been a lot of debate about this, and we could look at lots of kind of complex arguments, but there's one very definitive kind of um, easy piece of data that demonstrates uh, that sexual reproduction seems to be a better uh, solution for most species. And it is that when a lineage evolves sexual reproduction, and here's something to remember, 
sexual reproduction has actually evolved multiple times in the history of life on Earth. It's evolved at least once in the plants, at least once in animals, at least once in the fungi, and also in some other um, protozoan groups. Uh, but all of the earliest billion and a half, two billion years of life on Earth was completely asexual reproduction. So we begin with life on Earth being completely asexually reproducing, and then multiple lineages evolving the ability to reproduce sexually, and they do very well after that. But the asexual lineages are still filling their niches and doing well also. So here is the key to understanding this. When we map a loss of sexual reproduction, so there are lineages within the sexually reproducing groups that have certain species, certain genera, that have lost the ability to reproduce. But when we map that onto our phylogeny, we see it only in the tips of the phylogeny, only in these most apical branches. And so that's a very interesting pattern. If we see any characteristic that seems to be able to evolve multiple times, so it's happening a lot, this loss of sexual reproduction has happened over and over and over again. Why would it be only in the, brand, in the tips of the branches? If it happened a lot historically, we would expect to see some ancient lineages that lost sexual reproduction are still doing well and have uh, diversified as asexual reproducers. But yet we never see that. So the fact that we only see asexual reproducers within these sexual branches, so basically a loss of sexual reproduction, we only see it in the tips of the branches, means one of two things. Either it's only been possible to lose the ability to reproduce sexually recently, and so that's why we only see it in recent groups. Or it's been happening all along, but you have a low chance of survival if you are one of these asexual groups that's competing with closely related species that are sexually reproducing. And there doesn't seem to be any reason why it would have been impossible. All the mechanisms that cause asexual loss of sexual reproduction have been around and probably were around from the beginning. So probably there has been loss of sexual reproduction in these lineages over and over and over again throughout history, but there's a much higher chance of extinction for those lineages, and so we don't see long-term history for these groups that have lost the ability to sexually reproduce. And so that is the best, strongest evidence that sexual reproduction is the best solution um, for most species. And we'll look at, one, at some of these little bit more complicated arguments as to why sexual reproduction is the best solution. So this is evidence that it works better than asexual reproduction once it evolves. But the reasons why are a little bit more complex. Now, sex can have a very, very strong evolutionary force on organisms. One of the most obvious ones is sexual dimorphism. Okay? And in sexual dimorphism, we have a very clear behavioral or physical difference between males and females. So in many mammal species, we have both. We have behavioral differences and we have strong physical differences between males and females. So lions are a good example. Males physically are larger, have this large mane, have many different behaviors that are very different from the females. So that shows that there's been strong selection on these uh, behaviors that have allowed these organisms to do well. And it's different for different species in different environments. In birds, we have this uh, trend towards very bright feathers and elaborate courting rituals, um, and that distinguishes males from females. Uh, one of the weirder examples in vertebrates are the anglerfish. So remember Finding Nemo, that scene where they're way down deep in the ocean in the dark, and there's this lantern fish with the little glow-in-the-dark lure that tries to eat Dory and, um, what's his name, Marlin, Nemo's dad. Um, anyway. There are lots of species of anglerfish, and they have some bizarre methods of reproduction. So this is an image of a female anglerfish and a male. The female is this large, kind of funny looking, but it looks fish-like. The male is this little, almost vestigial uh, bag of sperm, basically, that has attached to the female. So when they are born, males and females look similar. The females grow to a larger size relative to the males. But the males stay small, and they swim around looking for a female. Once they find a female, they will attach to her, basically burrow into her skin, and they fuse their circulatory system with hers, and then all of their fish-like features basically decay, so all they are are a small little sack of eggs. Now this behavior has evolved because it makes those males very successful. They, they can mate with the female, you know, release sperm as she lays eggs all the time, and, and males that have stayed with females and eventually attached themselves to females did much better, but it's a really strong and bizarre form of sexual dimorphism.
And then lastly, another extreme form of sexual dimorphism. This is pedomorphism, but just in the females. So if you remember that term, that refers to a juvenile-like stage, even though they're av av available or they're able to reproduce. So in this species of insects, these are called strepsiptera. The females look like larvae their entire life cycle, and they can still mate, they can still have eggs. The males go through pupation like uh, other uh, whole metabolous insects. Those are ones that have a larva, a pupa, and an adult stage. They go through that pupal stage, they become adults, and they fly around looking for a female. Uh, they are parasites within other uh, arthropods, and when the male finds a female by uh, tracking her down with pheromones, he will pierce her abdomen because she doesn't have reproductive structures because she stays uh, in the juvenile form. But he'll pierce the outer wall of her body, inject sperm into her body cavity, the eggs develop, and then the eggs, as they grow, the larva will hatch out, the mother uh, will basically be killed when the eggs hatch out, and then the host that the mother's in will also die, and the little larva spread around and start the cycle of life over again. So a really bizarre uh, specialized life cycle for this um, uh, hyperparasitoid, that's the name of the, of the life cycle, they're parasites inside of another organism. So anyway, just very strong natural selection uh, resulting in these extreme behaviors. And most commonly, the most extreme and kind of unusual morphology is found in males. So like the large uh, mammals or the brightly colored birds with elaborate dances, uh, the, the uh, reduction to basically a parasitoid. So if we compare these species to other close relatives uh, that don't have strong sexual selection, it's typically the male that exhibits the strongest sexual selection. And we'll talk about that in Unit 4.2 as to why the, the force of, of sexual selection might be stronger on males than on females. Okay, So we kind of already addressed this. Sexual reproduction evolved multiple times. And we basically have two lines of evidence. Number one is, and the best line of evidence, is mapping sexual reproduction onto a phylogeny. And when we do that, we notice that it's happened at least once in the animals, at least once in plants. There's some argument as to whether it might have evolved more than once in those groups. And then several other times in other groups. Okay? The second line of evidence is simply the mode of sexual reproduction. Even though they're all meiotic, there are enough differences between uh, different sexually reproducing groups that that seems to be evidence that it evolved separately. If they evolved at the same time, we'd expect to see a little bit more similarity between those modes of sexual reproduction. So those are the two lines of evidence. Now, there are a few organisms that show somewhat of an intermediate stage or have the ability to both reproduce sexually and asexually. So alteration of ploidy is kind of an intermediate stage. This means that at one stage of your life you're diploid, for example, and another stage you might be haploid. Fusion of cells that then are able to go on and, and reproduce, even though it's not quite like mating in some groups, that fusion of cells is a little bit like joining of two individuals to make a new individual. But in this case, they don't make a separate new individual, they just make a fused version. So it's kind of an intermediate stage. And then some fungi have this thing called parasexuality, where it looks like a mix between mitosis and meiosis, and you get some recombination, but not quite as much as um, you would get during um, uh, mitosis. And then there need to be mechanisms, chromosomal losses usually the, the uh, mechanism, to prevent a duplication of all of the genetic material with each generation. If you do that just very shortly, you get exponential growth of the genome and way too much to, to be successful and survive. So yeast, common yeast and aspergillus, different yeast species, they can go through these kind of semi, it's like a hybrid between sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. Now, in most species where there is sexual reproduction, we have males and females. There are a few species that have isogamy. Isogamy, iso meaning equal or equivalent, and gamy referring to the gametes. So there are some species where there's no clear distinction, there's no males or females. Basically, everyone creates gametes, and every gamete can fuse with every other gamete. But isogamy is very, very rare. It's not very common. So anisogamy is by far the most common uh, strategy. 99.9% .9 of all sexually reproducing species have anisogamy. They have males and females. And the simple definition of what is a male and what is a female is actually very, very simple. Okay? So whether it's defined genetically during development or with temperature, like in some turtles, or in some other ways, there are actually many ways, um, many genetic ways, and then many other ways in which um, 
we can actually define and, and, and differentiate between males and females uh, developmentally. And sometimes organisms can switch partway through their life, but we can still define them very simply by just simply saying that males make the smaller gametes and females make larger gametes. So in short, males make sperm, eggs make, or sorry, females make eggs, and they both have to fuse to make an offspring. Now, the reason why 99.9% .9 of all sexually reproducing species separate into these two distinct differences with large gametes, eggs, and small gametes, sperm, is because of diversifying selection on any sort of variety or diversity that occurs in the early sexually reproducing population. So sex probably evolved initially in all groups as a single ability to fuse with any other member of your species. And at first glance, that would seem to be an advantage because you have a bigger pool of mates, right? If you could mate with anyone, you have a wider selection, especially if you're spread out, it would be easier to find a mate. That seems to, to be the best case scenario. However, there's this interesting dynamic, and this is most likely the reason why the vast majority of species separate into males and females fairly easily. Because at small gamete size, you have very, very high fitness. So fitness level for these little tiny gametes is high because you can make billions of them. So uh, mammals, for instance, can make billions and billions of sperm each day. And so that increases your success and your chances of having successful fertilization. Egg, uh, gametes that are very, very large also do well because they provision their offspring with a, a big head start, whether it's yolk so you can grow bigger, um, or you can do it faster because you have more resources to begin with. And so individuals with really large, large gametes do well. Individuals with really small gametes do well. Individuals in the middle, even if they make up a majority of the population early on, they start doing less and less well, and their numbers drop. And the numbers out here rise on both sides till eventually you get a clear separation, and then usually reinforcement of that difference through some sort of outside mechanism to make males and females. So this diversifying selection on the early gametes is the best explanation for why a nesogamy, right, or having two distinct sexes, males and females, that's why that dominates across the sexually reproducing world. Now, although sex overall creates a major benefit, and we'll look at that here in a little bit, there are some costs and even some fairly extreme costs to sexual reproduction. And so the benefits must be really, really big to outweigh these costs. So we're going to list uh, them. The second one here, I don't really, I think it's just kind of a silly one. We'll skip over it, but we'll do, we'll do others. I think there are four others. So number one, the cost of males. This is actually the largest cost to sexual reproduction. And basically, it's simple mathematics. If you have males and females, only half of your population can create eggs. So if the reproductive output of this female, she can lay four eggs or gestate four babies internally if she's a mammal, something like that, every two individuals can make four offspring. And then those uh, four individuals, because they would need a mate, could make eight more offspring and then so on. So we get doubling basically every generation uh, of this uh, population, two, four, eight, sorry, one pair, two pairs, four pairs, eight pairs, and so on. However, even at the same rate of reproduction with only four eggs, if you reproduce asexually, one female could have four babies and they would be all female, and each of them could have four. So you would basically do times four every time. So one, four, 16, 64. And you can see how this would be a much faster rate of population growth than if you have half of your males, half of your population being males. And so that is the highest cost of, of sexual reproduction is simply having half of your population not being able to lay eggs. Because males on their own could never reproduce because their sperm are too small and don't provide enough resources for the offspring. Females can and often do. There will be reversions to sexual reproduction, but initially in the, or eventually in the long run, the costs of that, in, uh, of reverting back, outweigh the costs of sexual reproduction. Okay, again, we're going to skip two. It's kind of a silly one, um, but I do want to go over these next three. Number three is that it takes lots of extra energy to reproduce sexually. This might come in the form of looking for a mate, of convincing that individual to mate with you. In some groups, this is extreme, like in a peacock. They have these tails that are so large, it actually creates um, a problem for the males. They have trouble flying. They can't get away from predators. So it takes lots of extra energy and risk to um, mate. Uh, even if you're not extremely different from the females and burning up lots of energy finding a mate, it can still be a risk finding a mate. So this is an example. This male frog has gotten up on a rock and has 
chirping, coursing away, trying to entice a female to come and mate with him. But he's called in, on, inadvertently called in a predator. So if he had been uh, a female, if we had an all sexual or an all female species reproducing asexually, they would be less exposed to predators. And then finally, mating inevitably exposes you to parasitism. Now, when I was first looking for a picture to illustrate this, I found this diagram of plushy sexually transmitted diseases. Um, it's kind of a little macabre. Um, but even non-sexually transmitted diseases, you have an increased rate of exposure if you're mating. If you never had to find a mate, you'd have less times when you could be exposed to disease. Uh, and less close contact with other members of your species transmitting that disease. So all of these do create a cost, and in some species quite a high cost, but overall it's this first one, the cost of males, that is the biggest cost of sexual reproduction. Okay. Now, what are the benefits that outweigh all of those costs? Because overall we know that sexual reproduction is better, especially in the long term, than asexual reproduction. Okay. Now simply put, all of these can be put under the general category of diversity. Sexual reproduction creates multiple combinations and creates lots and lots of genetic diversity in the population and that is the one thing that outweighs all those costs we just talked about. However, we can kind of subcategorize and look at different facets or different aspects of that diversity that's created via sexual reproduction. Okay? One of these was termed by an early researcher named Mueller, Mueller's ratchet. Now, the, in this one, ratchet refers to the tool, the um, instrument that you use to tighten bolts, right? And a ratchet works by only moving in one direction. And then if you push it back the other way, there's a little lock mechanism that won't allow it to uh, turn back the other way. And so Mueller's ratchet is this idea that in, in asexual species, little tiny negative mutations, which can be fixed just by random chance, genetic drift, um, or weird selection regimes that then go away, these negative mutations can build up in a population. And in asexual repro reproducing populations, they build up and build up and build up, and you can't go back um, in, like you can in sexual reproducing populations. And basically what happens in sexually reproducing populations is before these slightly negative or um, deleterious mutations become fixed, they're paired with other slightly negative mutations, and that shows, and that then results in a dramatic drop in fitness. And natural selection has more of an influence, and can work to remove more of the slightly negative mutations. So, sexual reproduction reduces the buildup of slightly negative mutations in a population, and that's Mueller's ratchet. Number two is kind of the flip side of that: is that beneficial mutations can be combined more rapidly, particularly if just by chance they occur in two different individuals in the same population simultaneously. So here we have an extreme example where we have an asexually reproducing population with three beneficial mutations labeled A, B, and C. Now because A is the best one overall, it begins to push out the original type in tan. It also pushes out C and B because it's slightly better than that. They're competing directly with those individuals and eventually do better than them. And so the only way we can get A and C in a single individual is if a subsequent mutation also brings back whatever this C mutation was. And then eventually, you know, here we have an a, a C and a B happening simultaneously. B outcompetes uh, the, the AB combination is better than the AC combination. AB outcompetes it. So it takes many, maybe thousands or tens of thousands of generations before we have all three of these random mutations combined in a single individual. However, of course, in sexually reproducing populations, if we have three beneficial mutations happening essentially simultaneously, they can be combined in offspring. And a C individual mates with an A individual, and some of their offspring are going to carry both of those beneficial traits. And so it's very easy to combine these simultaneous adaptive mutations. And then finally, the third one that we're going to talk about uh, directly here, and there's one other kind of wrap-up that's maybe a little different, but anyway, the third benefit of sexual reproduction is called the Red Queen Hypothesis. And this comes from a uh, scene in the book, Alice in Wonderland. And I don't think this scene made it into any of the movie versions. But in the book, Alice comes upon the Queen of Hearts, uh, the Red Queen. And she, the Red Queen is running as fast as she can, almost like she's on a treadmill. She's not going anywhere. She's just running and running, and her legs are moving. Uh, Alice in Wonderland is quite bizarre. Uh, Lewis Carroll was most likely high on um, opium while he was writing it. But anyway. So there are all these weird things that happen in it. But Alice comes upon the queen, and she's running and running as fast as she can, but not going anywhere. And so Alice says, what's going on? Why are you running? And the Red Queen says, don't you know that you have to run 
as fast as you can just to keep up. That's you know a um, synopsis of what she says in a nutshell. And so that was used by the people who first described this, this hypothesis. And this is the idea that organisms that are exposed to high uh, parasite levels need diversity and recombination that is provided by sexual reproduction just to keep up with the parasites. And they evolve in tandem with the parasites. The parasites evolve often through higher mutation rates, but sometimes they're sexually reproducing. Um, and so they evolve together, hosts and parasites, immune systems, the, the vir virulence of the parasites evolve together and they basically push one another and evolve together. And the hosts that can reproduce sexually are better able to co-evolve with their parasites and keep up with the parasites. And then lastly, this is just diversity, right? You can respond better to unpredictable environments. If the environment changes dramatically, so there's a zombie apocalypse, a few individuals might be immune to the zombie virus, right? Now that's a fictional version, but is based in reality where we have new viruses popping up all the time. Some of them are quite devastating. Uh, this COVID-19 virus is dangerous. It's not nearly as dangerous as some other diseases that humans have faced, particularly since we have good technology and the ability to kind of uh, have social um, rules and laws that allow us to uh, ameliorate the effects of the plague. But in many species, you can't do that, right? You don't go into a rabbit population and have the mayor of Rabbitville saying, hey, let's all hunker down and, and shelter in place so we don't spread uh, this uh, disease around or let's groom ourselves so ticks can't spread. That, that doesn't happen. And so many species are quite um, devastated by, by certain parasites. But if you have, or certain diseases, or, or even just like, you know, changes in the environment. But if you have lots and lots of variety, there's a much higher chance that a subset, maybe even a good chunk of your population, will be resistant or will be tolerant of the changes to the environment. So they'll do all right and your species will survive. So that's just diversity and variety that helps you cope with changing environments. Now some species, as I mentioned earlier, have the best of both worlds, meaning that they can re reproduce both sexually and asexually and take advantage of the benefits of both and then use the other, uh, avoid some of the disadvantages. So for example, uh, Daphnia, which is a freshwater crustacean found very commonly here in our ephemeral ponds. When it rains and these ponds fill up, they do really, really well. And it's a nice, rich, stable environment. They reproduce asexually and they're able to kind of fill up and take advantage of that newly formed pond as fast as they can. They outcompete other plankton in the pond because they can reproduce so quickly asexually. Once conditions begin to deteriorate, they go through a sexual cycle or two that allows them to maintain diversity. So by this, they can both reproduce quickly when conditions are right, and then switch back. And when environmental triggers tell them to, they reproduce sexually to maintain diversity in the population. Many, many plants can do this also, that have the ability to reproduce via pollen and ovules, but then also can reproduce asexually through vegetative growth or budding or some other form of asexual reproduction. Okay, so many species can do that, a few animals, and many, many plants.